Good morning, everybody. My name is Bridget Barker, and I'm from the Community Legal Education Branch of Legal Aid New South Wales. Welcome to this webinar, Making Estate and Death Administration Easier. I'm joined here today with your presenters, Natalie Darcy and Philip Schaefer from the New South Wales Trustee and Guardian, and Rebecca McHale from the Australian Death Notification Service, New South Wales Births, Deaths and Marriages. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you so much for having us today, Bridget. Before we begin the presentation, we would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands from where we are broadcasting today. I'm broadcasting from the land of the Widjibal Wyabal people of the Bundjalung Nation. We would also like to pay respect to the elders of this land, both past and present, and we extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people attending today's webinar or watching the recording. Just wanted to mention briefly that we've had some good news overnight that the Stolen Generations Reparations Scheme has been extended for 12 months. So that will not finish now until the 30th of June, 2023. Now we'll let you know what we're going to cover in today's webinar. The New South Wales Trustee and Guardian will speak to you about their organisation, the capacity, the, excuse me, capacity and the importance of planning ahead, wills, powers of attorney and enduring guardian, preparing and updating important legal documents, the role of an executor, then the Australian Death Notification Service will talk to you about this new service. They'll show you a walkthrough of the customer journey and tell you about important resources for you and your communities. And then at the end, we'll have time for questions. We will run a short poll during the webinar. And I'd also like to draw your attention at this point to another section of your control panel um, that says handouts. And there's a handout there, which is a brochure from the New South Wales Trustee and Guardian. You can download that handout during the webinar, uh, but we will also send a copy of it um, in an email to you following today's webinar. So right now I'll hand over to Natalie from the New South Wales Trustee and Guardian. Welcome, Natalie. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. And thank you everyone for coming today. It's great to be here. Um, so New South Wales Trustee and Guardian is a state government um, agency. Um, can I just have the next slide, Bridget, thanks. Um, I think some of our most important features are that we are independent and um, impartial, which is really important um, when you're dealing with people's, um, you know, private and family affairs, um, and also we're perpetual, so we're always around. We, you know, we're not going to to die. We've been around for a long time. We've been around for over 100 years now. Um, we've prepared over 1 million wills over that 100-year uh, period. We've administered almost a quarter of a million estates, and um, more than half a million people um, use our WillSafe, which is a secure storage facility where we can store um, people's important legal documents for them. Now, what we do, um, we not only make wills and other legal documents like powers of attorney and um, enduring guardians, we administer deceased estates as executor and administrator. We act as um, attorney for people under their power of attorney. Um, but we also um, support people who haven't planned ahead and don't have a power of attorney or enduring guardian in place. Um, they may lose capacity and then a court or tribunal steps in to appoint a financial manager or, um, or guardian for those people. Um, sometimes um, New South Wales trustee and guardian or the public guardian will be appointed to those roles and sometimes it will be a family member or friend. Um, if a family member or a friend is appointed as a financial manager for someone, we call that um, a, a private manager and um, they would act under the supervision of New South Wales trustee and guardian. Um, now we have quite a wide reach all around New South Wales. 
Um, we deliver our services across New South Wales through a branch network and we've got a little map that'll come up on the screen in a minute so I can show you where all of our branches there are located. There it is. So uh, right out to Broken Hill in the west, Lismore in the north, um, Wagga and um, Wollongong in the south and everywhere um, in between. Um, we have physical branches where people can go along and um, make their planning ahead documents, so their wills and their powers of attorney and appointments of enduring guardian. Um, but we also, you know, we, we also go to about 100 different um, local locations um, within New South Wales on what we call planning ahead days for those people who um, can't get to one of our physical branches. So we go out into the community. So, um, you know, chances are wherever you are in New South Wales, you know, we do come quite close to your location. And we also now offer um, video conference um, appointments for our customers as well. And that was really something that really took off, I suppose, during COVID um, when we were all trying to avoid physical contact with each other. But um, we found it's just so helpful for people who have trouble getting to a to a branch between the hours of nine and five, um, you know, to have that video conference facility um, available to have their appointments, to give instructions for their legal documents. Um, I'll just hand over to Bridget, who I think is going to take us through our poll. Yes, we're going to just launch a poll now, um, everybody. You can um, click on the screen to select your answer. The question is, do you have a will? And your choices are yes, yes, but I need to update it or no. And people are responding to that now. We'll just give them a little bit more time. Okay, I'll close off the poll now and we'll share the results. Okay, so we've got about 44% of us here today have got a will. Well, actually a lot more, sorry, have a will, um, but 28% do need to get their will updated. Okay, so we're all doing really quite well. Still a few people though who have some organising to do. Okay, I'll hide okay. those results and... So uh, we're about to bring some stats up on the screen of, um, this is the adult population of New South Wales. Now you'll see there, almost half of the population doesn't have um, a will. So that's why I said we're doing quite well here. We, we had a higher percentage than that. 69% um, of people don't have an appointment of enduring guardian and 66% don't have a power of attorney. So there's some really high figures, a lot of people who still have to get their, their important legal documents in place. Um, and as you'd expect, the older generations um, tend to have a higher percentage of people who have got their documents in place. I suppose they see a more immediate need for it, whereas the younger generations, I suppose, think, well, we've still got a long time to go before that's something we have to worry about. But at New South Wales Trustee and Guardian, we're always saying to people, look, you never know what's going to happen in life. Once you become an adult, once you turn 18 years of age, you really do need to have your legal documents in place because you just never know what's going to happen and um, you, you don't want to leave it too late. Um, now, a very common question we get is what happens if I die without a will? Now, if you die without a will, it's known as dying intestate. Um, now, essentially, there's a government formula. Um, Bridget, could you just go to the next slide, please? We've just got some information on there about intestacy. So um, there's a government formula and it's set out in legislation that determines who's going to receive your assets if you don't have a will. But the difficulty is that no two families are the same. What suits your family won't suit your next door neighbour's family. So it's really vital to have a will in place that takes into account your personal financial circumstances and that of your family and what their needs are. And it can take into account, you know, things like sentimental items. What are the individual needs of your family members and how can you best provide for them? Um, with a will, you can also um, think about things like pets. How are you going to make sure your pets will be looked after? You might want to make a donation to charity. Um, and all those sorts of things are not covered by our intestacy legislation, which is, you know, which is 
um, has to try and suit as many people as possible but doesn't take into account individual circumstances. Um, now another very common question we get is what happens if I lose capacity and I haven't made a power of attorney or an appointment of enduring guardian? So essentially it means you don't have a say in who's going to look after your affairs once you've lost capacity. So the Guardianship Division of NCAT, which is the New South Wales Civil and Administrative Tribunal, will decide who's going to look after your affairs if you haven't made um, your power of attorney and your appointment of enduring guardian. So um, the, the, the tribunal can appoint a financial manager to look after your legal and financial affairs and a guardian to make health and lifestyle decisions for you. And as you can imagine, they're such um, intensely personal decisions um, and, and things that have to be dealt with that really you need to be making the decision about who's going to take on those roles for you. It's really not something you want to, to leave up to a tribunal. So the, the big message is you know, make sure you plan um, you know, and, and you know, tell your family and friends and clients, plan while they have capacity. Um, if you leave it too late, then you lose the chance. Um, you know, it's a fairly regular occurrence that we at Trustee and Guardian do get asked to come along to make a, a power of attorney and an appointment of enduring guardian for someone who um, you know, is, is elderly and they're about to tr transition into um, aged care. And in some, you know, in many cases, they, they, they still have capacity and those documents can be made. But in, you know, in quite a few cases, unfortunately, it's not the case and it has been left um, too late to make those legal documents. Um, so again, you, th these are documents that you need to make before you need them. Um, you don't want to wait until you need them to get the documents in place. Um, now, witnessing of documents, in, enduring powers of attorney and appointments of enduring guardian um, have to be witnessed by certain qualified witnesses. You, you, you can't just um, you know, have anyone um, witness them for you, even a JP. Um, is not necessarily eligible to witness those documents. Um, so a solicitor is able to witness powers of attorney and appointments of enduring guardian and also um, approved employees of New South Wales trustee and guardian. And the reason they put those restrictions on who um, can witness those documents is that the witness has to um, sign a certificate saying that they explained the documents to the person and that they're satisfied that the person making the documents understood them. So you know, when we're making these documents for our um, customers at New South Wales Trustee and Guardian, we will explain the document and then we'll ask questions of the person to make sure that they do understand what the document's about, um, what the consequences of making the document are. Um, and that's of course for that person's own protection. We want to make sure the person's making the decision um, at a time when they understand the consequences of the decision and also it, it, that it's um, you know, their own personal decision, that they're not being influenced to make the document by someone else. Um, witnessing of wills is a little bit different. There, there isn't a special qualification for that, so, um, but you do need to be um, someone who's over the age of 18 to witness a will, and there are two witnesses required in New South Wales. So the three main documents we always say to people you, you really need to have in place um, to plan ahead is your power of attorney, dealing with your legal and financial affairs, your appointment of enduring guardian, dealing with your health and your lifestyle decisions, and then of course your will. So we'll just go through each one of those in a little bit more detail one by one. So first of all, your power of attorney. So essentially that appoints a person, um, like a family member or a friend, or a trustee organisation like New South Wales Trustee and Guardian, to make um, you know, financial and legal decisions for you and take all of the actions in relation to those legal and financial matters. So it can be everything from withdrawing your money from your bank account to pay your bills, um, selling your house, signing legal contracts, all of those sorts of things. Now, one of the most crucial decisions you're going to make when you're thinking about your power of attorney is who are you going to appoint? Who is the right person or organisation to choose? So some of the things to um, think about there, and we'll just pop on to the next slide, thanks Bridget, um, is it, it, you need to choose someone who 
has the ability and is comfortable dealing with legal and financial matters. So are they comfortable dealing with, you know, real estate agents, with your tax agent or accountant, with your superannuation fund, all of those sorts of things. One thing to keep in mind is a, a power of attorney in the wrong hands can be a tool for elder abuse uh, or financial abuse. And unfortunately, we see that more often, far more often than we would like, um, where, you know, um, the person who's been appointed as attorney, it's, it's too much of a temptation for them having access to the person's bank account and other financial resources, and they do use the funds for their own benefit and not for the person not for the benefit of the person whose, you know, whose assets they are, which is a really sad situation. And, and even more sad sometimes it, you know, it is a very close family member, a son or daughter, who um, is the perpetrator of that financial abuse. So we always say to people, you have to make sure you trust, you can trust your attorney implicitly. You've got no concerns um, that that might happen to you. Um, some other things to think about, if you're appointing, more, you can appoint more than one attorney. So some people might appoint two of their children. You need to think about, will they be able to agree? Will they be able to act together? Um, if they can't, then there might be a stalemate, which is going to be a problem. And then there are some other practical considerations to consider, like um, you know, where does your attorney live? Um, if your attorney lives over the other side of Australia or they live overseas, it, it's, it's going to be quite difficult for them to just to do those day-to-day -day tasks for you that need to be done. And also, do they have the time to devote to the task? Um, you know, it can be time consuming. So um, is that something they're willing to do? Now, your enduring guardian. Um, so that's where you're appointing a person to make health and lifestyle decisions for you if you lose capacity sometime into the future. Now, the, unlike the power of attorney, the power of attorney can operate not only when you lose capacity, but it can operate um, while you've still got capacity, but if you want someone to step in for you, like you're, you've gone overseas and you need someone to deal with your affairs back home, or you know you, you just may not want to deal with your financial affairs anymore, you may want someone else to take over the task as you you know get on in years. The enduring guardian is a little bit different in that it only comes into play once you've lost capacity, and your enduring guardian um, makes decisions about things like your accommodation, where you're going to live. So if you had to transition into an aged care facility, they would make the decision of, of where you would go. Um, also, they make decisions about medical and dental treatment and also personal services, which might be things like home care. Um, and again, the, one of the most crucial decisions will be who are you going to choose as your enduring guardian? And it really needs to be someone who understands your wishes and preferences. Um, is it someone who would make the, the same sorts of decisions that you would have made for yourself about your accommodation, about your personal services, about your medical and dental treatment? And then all of those practical issues that we talked about in relation to the power of attorney, like where does your guardian live? Um, if you've got more than one guardian, do they get along? Are they going to agree? All of those things need to come into it as well when you're making your decisions. Now, another document we haven't talked about yet um, is an advanced care directive. So essentially that document sits alongside your appointment of enduring guardian. And it's a document that really gets into the detail um, of your wishes for healthcare and treatment if you can't make decisions for yourself. So the appointment of enduring guardian is the document where you're appointing the person who's going to make the decisions for you. And the advanced care directive sets out specific wishes for health care and treatment. And it might be things like end of care, end of life treatment. What sort of treatment would you find unacceptable? What sort of treatment would you like to have? Um, and if you've made a valid advanced care directive, then your guardian does need to follow that. Um, you, you can have an appointment of enduring guardian without having an advanced care directive. And many people do, and that's okay. But it is a really good idea to make the advanced care directive because it, it really gives a good guide to your guardian about what your wishes are and the sorts of decisions you would like them to make. And then lastly, we've got the will. So I think most people know what a will is, but essentially it's a legal document that sets out who you want to receive your assets um, when you die. 
Um, it's also the document where you point, appoint your executor, which is the person who's going to um, be responsible for dealing with your estate when you die. Um, and it can also set out your funeral wishes as well. So whether you wish to be buried or cremated and any special wishes that you might have. Now, one thing about a will is that it's not set and forget. You do, it is something that as your life changes, you do need to um, think about it, um, review it in conjunction with a professional like your solicitor or New South Wales trustee and guardian. And then you may need to update it a number of times um, as you go through life. So up on the screen there are some of the times in your life when you may need to change your will. Um, so certainly if you, you marry, um, marriage does affect your will and you, and you will likely need to make a new one. Um, similarly, divorce, if you get divorced or separated, um, you should make a new will. Um, if you're commencing or ending a de facto relationship, also if you've got new people coming into your life and that might be more children or more grandchildren or um, anyone else who becomes dependent on you, that's a really important time to update your will. If you've got um, big changes in your assets, you're acquiring or selling property, again, your will should be reviewed then because that might impact the terms of your will. Um, and of course, if you want to change your executors or, or beneficiaries. And again, retirement, always a good time to review. You'll be reviewing your financial situation and you should review your will at that time as well. Now, I just wanted to say a few little things about what's involved in administering a deceased estate. And this is really important to understand when you're, when you're choosing your executor, um, because you need to have an appreciation of the sorts of things that they're going to be involved in. So generally the executor is the person who'll be arranging your funeral. They're responsible for making decisions about um, the disposal of your body and your funeral arrangements. They'll also need to confirm all of your assets and debts and they might, depending on how well they know your financial affairs, they might need to do some investigation there to make sure they've captured everything. Um, they need to make sure the assets of the estate are protected and by that I mean making sure that everything's insured, is all your insurance up to date, um, if you've got any um, valuable items like jewellery, making sure that they're stored away securely. Um, they'll need to notify various organisations of your death and that includes things like banks, um, other businesses, government departments um, and um, Rebecca is going to tell us about the Australian Death Notification Service um, soon, which is a really useful tool. Um, some other things the executor might have to do is you know, selling or realising assets, finalising tax affairs, keeping an accounting of the, state, the estate and um, a key one can be defending any claims. If there's any litigation against the estate, it's the executor who is the person who, who's dealing with that. And then finally, um, they're distributing the estate. Um, so some key um, sort of qualities you need in your executor is it needs to be someone who will act impartially, who's not going to prefer their own interests over the interests of um, the beneficiaries. Um, and unfortunately we do see some examples from time to time where um, an executor doesn't do that. It might be you know, a com reasonably common example we see from time to time is where an executor is living in the estate property and it has to be sold to be divided between all of the children but they remain in the property for you know quite a long time and um, the other beneficiaries can get quite upset about that. So you do need to think when you're choosing your executor, is it someone who will act impartially and act in the best interests of all the beneficiaries rather than preferring their own interests? Um, they need to act promptly um, and they need to maximise the value of the estate for the beneficiaries. They've got an obligation to do that. And it's important to be aware that if an executor does the wrong thing, um, they can be personally and financially liable for the mismanagement of the estate. So choosing your executor, um, you know, there are a few different options you can choose, family member or friend. Um, you can choose an organisation like New South Wales Trustee and Guardian. Um, I think sometimes when people are appointing a family member or friend, they, they almost feel like they're bestowing a compliment on the person. But you do really need to think, you know, are they the best person for the job? Do they have the required knowledge and skills to carry out the task? Are they going to be overwhelmed by the workload? Um, keep in mind if it's, you know, if it's someone close to the person making the will, they might be grieving. 
um, you know, they, they might find taking on the task of the executor difficult. So it's always a good idea to ask the person that you're intending to appoint as executor to make sure they feel comfortable with it and they'd be happy to do it. Um, some people choose to appoint New South Wales trustee and guardian as executor because it's an impartial um, organisation and perpetual, we're always going to be around and we do have that, um, you know, that expertise um, it, and we've been doing it for a very long time. Now just, I'm, I'm almost ready to pass over to Rebecca, but just one more thing I just wanted to say before I finish up, um, because I often get asked, is it okay to make a will yourself? Can you use those um, DIY will kits, you know, are, are they valid, are they legal? So the answer is yes, they can be legal um, and, and you can make a valid will using those, but we do see a lot of problems with them. Um, one of the, the biggest issues we I've seen with them before is the wording that people use in them and that's because the way you speak in everyday life, when you put that down in a legal document like a will, um, the words might not have the legal meaning that you intend. There can be ambiguity and it can lead to a really expensive legal case that ends up costing the estate you know, many thousands of dollars, sometimes tens of thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars and sometimes um, a lot more. Um, so sometimes trying to save money by making a do-it-yourself will can end up costing your estate you know, many, many thousands of dollars. So it, it's not, not worth it. Um, some other problems we've seen with do-it-yourself wills is, um, you know, failure to appoint an executor, um, not signing it properly, not having it witnessed properly. Um, but the other thing is too, if, if you're making a do-it-yourself will, you're missing out on the opportunity to get good professional advice um, about things like tax planning, you know, what, finding out what the, what the capital gains tax consequences are of gifts in your will, um, getting some advice about guardianship for children, um, about the possible use of trusts, um, and also about claims that can be made um, upon the estate. The other, we, we've also seen a rise um, recently in online do-it-yourself wills, um, you know, they can have the same sorts of problems. The other thing to keep in mind too is when you're having your will made by a professional, they'll be testing your capacity to make the will, which can be really important if the will is later contested that there's someone there who can give evidence about what your capacity was like, which unfortunately is not possible with, with um, the do-it-yourself wills in the same way. Now I'm handing over to Rebecca now, who's going to tell us about the Australian Death Notification Service. Thank you so much, Natalie. Some um, really great detailed information in there about all of those different legal documents. So um, I'm sure that's been informative for everybody. Um, I'm gonna talk to you about a service today that actually comes in once someone has already died. Um, and, you know, either yourself, um, a member of your community, family, friend or a client might need to get in touch with a lot of different organisations to notify them of the death. Um, so because the name of the service is a little bit lengthy, you might also hear me refer to it today as the ADNS, um, just short for the Australian Death Notification Service. So um, I work in the National Products team at the New South Wales Registry of Birth, Deaths and Marriages and we administrate this product on behalf of and with the support of all registries across Australia. So it's a service that's not only available within New South Wales but across the country as well. So today I'm going to walk you through um, what the Australian Death Notification Service is, who can use it, when they can use it. Um, we'll take a look at some of the pain points faced by citizens following a death um, and how the ADNS supports people through this journey and how you can assist your clients in finding and using the ADNS as well. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit about how death data in Australia is shared um, with services and partner organisations and take you on a walk through of what it actually looks like for somebody using the Australian Death Notification Service as well. Uh, right at the very end, before we have some questions, I'll also briefly touch on a couple of other online resources on New South Wales government sites. So either on um, nsw.gov.au site or Service New South Wales sites that provide some really great information to support anyone in the process of just organising end of life legal documents, as well as navigating everything that happens following a death too. 
So when someone dies, the, those that are closest to them are often charged with letting organisations know of the death. Um, and at the Australian Death Notification Service, we refer to this as the death administration process. And as we've um, heard from Natalie, this actually only forms quite a small part of um, estate administration overall, um, but it's still a significant um, time spent, you know, after someone passes away to notify organisations. So from the citizen research conducted, we discovered that this can take anywhere up to 30 hours and include up to 40 forms. So it's, you know, it's a lot of administration, just letting people know. So while someone's already grieving, it can be emotionally draining to repeat the story of the death to multiple organisations. So for the purpose of today's webinar, I'm going to tell the story of Sarah and Sarah's Uncle James. So James has recently passed away and Sarah now needs to get in touch with a number of organisations to either close or transfer her Uncle James's accounts and memberships. Sarah might choose to do this via phone, calling a contact centre, um, via messaging on social media, website, live chat, etc. And that then opens up multiple interactions for Sarah to keep track of. And it's likely that she'd need to have numerous painful conversations with a lot of different deceased estate to teams, just repeating that same story over and over. With lots of different organisations to contact, Sarah might struggle with where to start with this, um, or even with who to notify. And all of this is happening while she's in a cloud of grief, feeling reactive and just handling these interactions as they pop up. This can quickly become a pretty burdensome process for Sarah, particularly um, if she also has an official role in the estate administration, such as the executor or the administrator of her Uncle James's will. So this is where the Australian Death Notification Service comes in. The service has been designed to ease some of that administrative burden following a death by allowing multiple organisations to be notified at the same time via a single secure online platform. The service is really designed to support someone like Sarah in her experience of the death administration process. Anyone can use the service, so it doesn't necessarily have to be an executor um, or an administrator, but it can be. It could also be an next of kin, um, another family member, a solicitor, a support worker, friend, employer, etc. So we don't limit um, who can actually notify organisations of the death. We keep that open to everybody. So in facilitating multiple organisations to be notified at the same time, the service reduces that burden of the back and forth initial communication for someone like Sarah, and it provides her with a clear starting point, letting her be a bit more proactive in beginning the death administration process, but also reducing the amount of time that she'll spend on this overall. Something to note is that uh, prompt notification of a death is really important as it reduces the likelihood of continued billing and communication going out to the deceased, which can be particularly upsetting for their loved ones. And it also reduces the likelihood of something called tombstone theft. So tombstone theft um, refers to criminal actions being conducted in the name of a deceased person whose identity details um, have been obtained, you know, either via discarded bills, um, bank statements, data breaches, etc. So prompt notification to organisations is really key. So who can be notified and when via the Australian Death Notification Service? So the service facilitates notifications to a number of different organisation types. Um, the service is designed for notifications of deaths that occur in Australia and so therefore all organisations that can be notified are based in Australia. So they include organisations like you know, banks, um, superannuation companies, utilities, insurance, charities, um, state-based state government agencies, um, local councils, which is a growing category on the service, and education services as well. Currently, we have more than 75 organisations that can be notified of a death across all those different categories. What we also have on site is a nominate function. So if someone um, is either just visiting the site or using the site to notify of a death and they notice that there's, you know, there's organisations that have not yet joined the service that they would need to notify, then they can actually submit a nomination for those organisations. That just allows our partnership team to review um, the types and individual organisations that people are wanting to see on the service and allows, allows us to reach out to those organisations um, to provide them with some information about the service and to request that they join as well. 
Something that's important to note is that the service is free to use um, for all, all individuals notifying of a death and it's also free for organisations to join. So we've tried to really um, eliminate as many barriers as possible to pe people either using the service or to organisations partnering with the service um, so that it maintains that value. So how does the service work? So there's five simple steps. Um, there's a couple of important things to note um, about who can use the service. So the first one is that the death needs to have occurred in Australia. So the data set that sits on the back end of this service um, relates to deaths that have occurred in Australian states and territories only. And the second important thing to note is that the death must be registered. So generally, you know that the death has been registered because the death certificate has been issued, you know, following on from a funeral, for example. So there's five simple steps in submitting a notification. So the first one, um, entering the details of the person who has died. Second step, um, the details are checked on the back end just to um, make sure that that death has actually been registered. And I'll come back to that in a minute and explain how that works. Um, step three for the person notifying of the death is to capture their details as a notifier name and contact details. Step four is to select the organisations that you want to notify of the death. And the final step is that the selected organisations receive um, a notification, so either via email or via system to system sharing, and they will then contact the notifier within 10 business days to advise of next steps or anything else that's needed to close or transfer accounts. So what makes the ADNS beneficial for both notifiers and partner organisations is the single source of truth of death data that sits on the back end of the service. So in that second step where um, the details of the deceased are verified, that actually is checked against something called the Australian Death Check. So all birth, deaths and marriages around Australia um, send data daily into this Australian Death Check. So it's got up to date um, information about anyone who has died in Australia um, pretty much immediately within 24 hours of that death being registered. Um, that's what sits on the back end of the service for verification. Um, and that way the organisations that are receiving the notification through this service can be confident that they're actually um, dealing with the actual details of someone that has passed away. So let's take a bit of a look through the customer journey. Now Bridget and I are going to do a bit of a green swap so that I can share my screen and actually um, show you what the site looks like. I'll show you some of the key features of the website and then we'll walk through the notification process. Let me just quickly select which screen. I think we should be good to go and you should be seeing my screen shortly. Um, I'll actually walk through um, a notification itself. Um, as Sarah for her Uncle James so that you can see exactly what that process looks like from start to finish as well. Um, so hopefully what you're all seeing right now is a copy um, of my screen and of the Australian Death Notification website. Um, so you can notice here, um, right front and centre, there's some messaging that says before you get started, you do need to make sure that um, the death has been registered, that you've received a death certificate. So that's really key. Um, if you're just on here having a bit of a look around, you can take a look at the participating organisations. And here's the nominate function that I mentioned earlier as well. So you can just note, note there any organisations that you would like to um, see on the service. There's a great little animation video that runs it just under a minute. So if there's anyone that you'd like to showcase the service with within your organisation or within the community, that's a really great way um, that just captures key messaging about how the service works. We've got our five simple steps highlighted here. We've also got a guide to the information you need. So um, when I talked earlier about, you know, Sarah might not even know potentially which organisations that she needs to notify of her Uncle James's death. And so there's a guide in here um, with some tips essentially about how to track that information down, you know, whether it's um, checking a wallet that contains licenses and cards and things along those lines or um, checking emails for, for bank statements and things like that. So there's some good information on there as well. So we'll click on get started and I'll walk you through submitting a notification. So Sarah has received her Uncle James's death certificate. So in this instance, 
Sarah will select yes, a death certificate has been issued. Her uncle James passed away in New South Wales. And this is where Sarah will enter her uncle James's details. So his first name and last name. And she'll also enter his date of birth and his date of death as well. So this is the information that is going to verify against that single source of truth, the Australian death check. So you can see straight away that we do have a, a successful match in this instance and Sarah can proceed with submitting this notification. So here Sarah's being asked for her uncle James's last known address, which is 123 Smith Street in Kempsey, New South Wales. And she knows that he did own that property, so she can select yes here. If her Uncle James did own other property within Australia, whether it was you know, a holiday home or investment property, there's also the ability to capture that information down below. Sarah gets asked if her Uncle James owned a business in Australia. So if she did select yes, she could immediately search the ABN or ACN there as well. Um, in this instance, her Uncle James did not own a business in Australia, so we'll just click on no and proceed from there. Did this person hold accounts in any other's name? Sarah knows that her uncle James was known by, uh, known as Jim by pretty much everybody and there is a possibility that maybe some of his accounts are listed in Jim as well. So she is gonna notify organisations that he may also have had an account in the name of Jim Johnson rather than James Johnson. She'll then just enter his email address Um, noting that you can add multiple email addresses. You know, some people might have a bill that goes to their work email or their, or their personal email. So there's the ability to capture multiple email addresses there um, that could potentially help organizations to search their customer database too. And also her uncle James's phone number. Um, just noting as well, these details aren't mandatory. We know that not all citizens have an email address um, or a phone number. So you only need to enter those um, if those details are available. Now Sarah gets to the stage where she will select the organisations that she'd like to notify of. So she has checked through emails, filing cabinets in his home, wallets, etc., and obtained as much information as possible. So she knows that he did have a home loan with ANZ and an everyday savings account with St George Bank. So she'll select both of those. She knows that his super was with Hester Super. That he had internet with Commander. And also a mobile phone with Optus, so she'll select those. And also he lived in um, Sydney and was paying rates to Sydney Water, so she'll need to notify them also. She'll also select the city of Sydney as her Uncle James's counsel to notify. And this is a category that um, I guess is fairly recent on the service and is growing quite quickly with councils coming on board almost every week at the moment. She also has the ability to select government services. Uh, so you can see our friends from New South Wales, trustee and guardian in there if they needed to be notified. You know, if you had any trade licenses, Sarah could notify Safe Work. She knows that he had um, car insurance with Allianz and also home and contents with NRMA, so she'll select those from the insurance category. And she also knows that her Uncle James was um, donating regularly via direct debit to the Australian Red Cross, so she'd also like to notify them as well. So again, um, users have the option to um, nominate organisations that they haven't seen on there. Um, we get a little nice little capture here of the amount of organisations that have been selected. So let's click on that to review. So we've got a nice little list here of all of the organisations that have been selected. So that can be edited um, or changed at this stage. Sarah's happy with all of the organisations that she selected there, so she'll click on next. Now this is where Sarah's going to enter her own details as the notifier, and this gives organisations contact details, a name, telephone number, email address, et cetera, so they can reach back out to the notifier and provide um, next steps for the account. So Sarah will enter her phone number, her email address, 
Um, in this instance, Sarah's being asked if she has an official role in the estate. If she didn't have an official role in the estate and selected no, Sarah then has the option um, to qualify her relationship with James. So in this case, she'd say relative. Um, Sarah is actually the executor. So in this instance, she's going to tick yes. And she's then asked, is she the executor or the administrator? So what we do know is that about 75% of people that notify of a death via this service do identify as having an official role in the estate. So we don't actually have any way of checking that. There's no central register of wills in Australia. So again, that's something that organisations may reach back out to Sarah to say, we need you to provide a copy of the will, um, noting that you're the executor to proceed. So now we've reached the stage where all of the data has been captured that's required to notify organisations. So we have all of Uncle James's details here. We can review the organisations that have been selected by category and edit if needed. And also the opportunity to, to just verify um, Sarah's details as the notifier here. So Sarah's happy with all of that information that has been entered. She's just going to tick the privacy statement, um, essentially saying that she's aware that this information will be sent through to the organisations that she's selected. And she will then just click on confirm and notify. It's just taking a little minute to go through. Um, but straight away, Sarah receives that reference number. So she knows that um, the notification has been submitted successfully. She will receive an email with that reference number as well as a copy of all of the information that she's input, um, as well as the individual organisations. They'll also receive an email with the, the information for both her Uncle James and herself um, to act on. So Sarah gets some information on this page about next steps, which is that the organisations that she selected will then reach back out to her um, individually to advise of next steps and also provides her with some access to other death and bereavement and support services and the ability to provide just a thumbs up, thumbs down or some extended feedback as well. So that's the Australian Death Notification Service um, customer journey from end to end. So it is you know, quite straightforward. It just takes that little bit of, little bit of research before using the service. Um, to make sure that you've got a good idea about the organisations that you're wanting to notify. So I might just hand back to Bridget now to the slide deck. And then we'll talk a little bit more about the service and a couple of other support resources. Fantastic. Thank you, Bridget. So if we have a look at some of the feedback that we have received to date, from users of the service. Um, they've said things like the process was quick and simple and I notified multiple businesses at once. I wish I found out about this earlier. This was surprisingly simple. Compliments for implementing such a service. It's been of great assistance to me as the next of kin of someone who passed away in a fire where most of his documents were destroyed. Um, so for us, being you know a relatively new service, we've been around for about uh, I guess 12 months as a fully fledged service and a little bit longer running as a pilot service initially. That user feedback is really important to us and it's a, it's a key driver in making improvements to the service over time as well. So how do people actually know that the service exists? So we've just had a look at the site, but how do people find the site? How do they know that this is available for them to use when they're in that situation and they need to, to notify organisations of a death? Um, so we do have some paid um, search engine marketing that targets 42 words and phrases, just things like what to do when someone dies, how to notify organisations when someone dies, et cetera, um, that help us you know, appear near the top of the search so that people know that we're around. We do actually have a digital um, national marketing campaign running at the moment through until the end of July, just to raise general awareness in you know, population over 18 about the service. We do also distribute um, that little flyer that you're seeing up there on the screen. On the left, it's just a front and black back flyer that has key information about the service, how it can help people, as well as the site information, the deathnotification.gov.au um, or a QR code that can be scanned to access the site. So 
So that is currently going out with all death certificates issued in New South Wales, and it's also going out um, with all death certificates in a number of other states and territories around the country as well. We're also really trying to get out to lots of different community um, and industry events. We were recently at the Seniors Expo in New South Wales, and it was great to meet people, meet people there, um, hear what they thought about the service, and again, just raise awareness um, that this is here to support people after somebody dies. We do work quite closely with funeral directors as well in New South Wales, who are great advocates of the service. So how can community walk workers support this service? So I guess firstly, talking to your clients about the service, um, talking to your family and friends about the service as well, so that they know that it's out there. Um, you could potentially add information or a link to the service to your website. So we do have a comms pack available. Um, so if appropriate, you know, promote the, the service on your organization's social media channels to help your clients and communities connect with the service. Um, we do have the DL flyer that was on the previous slide available for order. So if you work for an organization where you know you have packs or you're supporting um, people during during bereavement, directly following a death, you might like to order some of those flyers um, to have on hand or to have in those packs as well. So what I have put up on the screen here is a QR code which will just take you through to a Dropbox file, and that includes our external communications pack. So we've got some wording, you know, some web copy um, and some digital images as well that you could potentially use from that pack on your website, social channels, etc. cetera. Um, and there's also some information in that little, um, either QR code or the link at the bottom of the screen there as well, with details on how to order the flyers. Um, or you can email the address at the bottom of the screen there to obtain any further educational tools that you think might support your organisation um, in just connecting people with this important service as well. And I believe a copy of this slide deck will be shared following the presentation too, so you'll have access to this, that QR code and all the links, etc. There's a couple of other resources that I did want to bring to your attention today. So both have been developed by the New South Wales Government Life Journeys team. So the Life Journeys team sit within the Department of Customer Service. We're very lucky to have them. For the past three years, they have been mapping out customer life events um, just across the spectrum um, for New South Wales citizens to really uncover any pain points and develop products or services that can help to make those um, key life events a little bit easier. So the Life Journeys team were the team that conducted the research and discovery around end of life. Um, and they were a huge part in um, the formation of the Australian Death Notification Service. So a couple of other tools or resources that they have developed that sit on New South Wales government websites. Um, the first one is the end of life planner tool. So this tool provides information on planning um, end of life documents and it can be accessed via the My Service New South Wales account. So anyone that has a My Service New South Wales account can um, access information about wills, power of attorney, injury and guardian. And the tool's really designed to help you before you meet with a professional advisor or solicitor, just by breaking down a little bit like what Natalie's done today, what's required for complex legal documents. And it then allows you to book an appointment um, either with trustee and guardian or search the Law Society of New South Wales for registered solicitors as well. So that's quite a handy tool. Um, they also have a funeral tool that's a funeral planner tool, sorry, that's currently in development as part of that end of life planner. Um, I believe that's not too far away from going live, and that's something that allows people to just sit down and consider. Um, what their wishes are for their body and for their funeral following death as well. So that's something that will be available in the near future. The other resource that's um, fantastic, which is, I guess it more comes into play directly following a death is the end of life navigator tool. And that's really a guide to help you make the right decisions following a death. So including things you know, like organizing the funeral, getting a death certificate, um, Cancelling or transferring services, so it refers to the Australian Death Notification Service, dealing with a will at, will at a state, acting as the executor, etc. So I've also linked 
um, those services to this slide as well. So when you have access to the slide deck, you can jump online and have a bit of a look around at those, but they're all excellent resources, um, either you know planning for end of life or directly following a death as well. So that is it from me, and I believe we are handing back to Bridget for some questions. Thank you so much, Rebecca, and thank you, Natalie, for your presentations. I think that the audience has really found um, the information valuable. There are a number of questions that I'll address in just one minute. There's one other slide I wanted to show people just to let you know about some upcoming webinars that Legal Aid has. So tomorrow we have a webinar on mortgage stress um, and we have someone from our specialist consumer team presenting that webinar. And then at the end of July, um, there's a webinar, a family law webinar on separation, divorce and property. So now um, I'll just start raising um, the questions for you. Natalie, there's a, a few for you from your uh, presentation. So some of these may well have been answered um, as, your, as you went through your presentation, but I'll, I'll just um, put them to you anyway in case there was something else that the person might want to know. But uh, the first question is a general question um, is about the will safe. Um, sorry, I've just lost the visibility of it. I'm just going to go back to it. Does uh, the will safe allow storage of important documents other than the will you prepare? For example, title deeds or other important documents? Um, so we store um, wills, powers of attorney and appointments of enduring guardian. Um, and whilst um, yes, we do store um, certificates of title or title deeds for houses, but in New South Wales, um, they're all essentially um, online now. Um, that, that's happened in the last couple of years. So your paper certificate of title is, um, yeah, it's not, you, you don't need to store those anymore. They're, they're, it's all online. That's something I didn't know. You learn something every day, don't you? Um, so I think you probably did cover this, but th this question came up. What is the difference between enduring guardian and power of attorney? Yep. yep. So the, the power of attorney is about the legal and the financial issues and the enduring guardian is about um, health and lifestyle situations. So if you think of it like um, if someone is living at home and they're having difficulty and they're about to transition into aged care, it would be the um, enduring guardian who makes the decision that, okay, this person, um, will, will, you know, will transition them into aged care and they choose the facility that the person will go into. And it's the attorney who's responsible for organising the financial side. So if the house has to be sold to pay the um, accommodation deposit, the attorney does that. They are the ones who hand over the money to the um, to the aged care facility, you know, both, uh, you know, accommodation deposit and the ongoing fortnightly amounts. Thank you. Another question for you is, how is enduring guardianship able to be put in place for someone who doesn't have relative friends or other particular people that they can trust? Yeah, look, that's a really tricky one because um, you, you actually can't appoint. So if a person doesn't have any family or family members or friends who are suitable to act as um, their enduring guardian, um, you can't actually appoint the public guardian. The, um, the guardianship tribunal, the guardianship division of NCAT can appoint the public guardian as guardian for someone if there are no suitable family or friends available, but you can't actually do that in your enduring guardian document. And that's because of the way the legislation um, is set up. Um, so look, if, if there isn't an enduring guardian um, appointed, there is something called the person responsible. Um, and there's a there's a hierarchy in the legislation and that's the person who can make you know medical and, and health type decisions for you. And it starts with your, you know, your spouse and then essentially the next closest people to you. But yeah, unfortunately if there is nobody available to appoint, then you wouldn't make that document and you would leave it up to um, NCAT if and when the time came. Hopefully you never need to worry about it and you you know, retain your capacity all of your life. But if that doesn't happen, 
then the guardianship division of NCAT would appoint um, the public guardian if there's no one else suitable when the time comes. Thank you. Um, and then just a, a question about wills, which I, I'm pretty sure that you did address during your presentation, but what is the legal stance on handwritten or will kit wills? I know you had that yeah. slide that spoke to that, yeah. Yeah, so look, um, you can buy the, you know, often from the post office or the news agents, the will kits. Um, and look, if they're completed properly and signed and witnessed properly, um, and there's you know rules in the legislation setting out what the requirements are for a valid will. If all of that's complied with, it's a valid will. Um, similarly, with um, you know some people might just write down on a blank sheet of paper um, the terms of their will and have that signed and properly witnessed. Again, that can be a valid will. But the difficulty we do see is doing it, doing it without professional assistance. You know we see ambiguity in the wording, which leads to court action after the death and huge legal fees and or you know the you know the person making the document might not fully understand all of the witnessing requirements and not comply with those, which can again lead to a lot of legal costs after the death as well. Another question is, what is the difference between an executor and an administrator? So an executor is the person appointed by the will. Um, they're named in the will as the executor. An administrator is when um, there isn't an executor validly appointed in the will, or there is no will. So there is no, you know, there was no document to appoint an executor. So let's say someone passes away without a will. Um, there's the, what we call the intestacy laws. So legislation sets out who the beneficiaries will be. The major beneficiary or major beneficiaries of the estate would generally apply to the Supreme Court to become what's known as the administrators of the estate. They're not an executor because they weren't appointed by a person making a will, but they're the people who are going to be administering the estate. Thank you. Uh, one last question for you. If you don't have power of attorney and a parent has been diagnosed with dementia, what happens then? Yeah, so if you've got an elderly parent who has lost capacity and they've not made a power of attorney document, um, if they need someone to manage financial affairs for them, um, then you would need to, you or any other interested person can make an application to the guardianship division of NCAT um, for a financial manager to be appointed for that person. Um, and NCAT would first look to whether there's any suitable family members um, or close friends around who um, are suitable to be appointed. Um, and a lot of times that will be the case. Um, if there's no one suitable or perhaps if there would, there are some people around but there's conflict, um, then they may appoint New South Wales trustee and guardian to be the financial manager for that person. Okay, thank you. Um, then we've had some thank yous to both of you for your presentations and um, uh, a great thank you for um, the Australian Death Notification Service um, existing. So it's great that we can get the word out there to people. Um, and so far they're all the questions that we've had. Does anybody else have any more questions before we finish up today? Some thank yous for a great presentation with practical information. So um, it's great that we were able to bring this information to people today because obviously um, it's useful and it's going to help um, get the word out about um, the new Australian Death Notification Service and um, give people the that essential and important information about planning for end of life and um, the documents that you need. I found the presentation very clear and I'm hoping that our audience did too. So it was um, very helpful. We're just getting lots of thank yous now and um, people saying it's a, been a fantastic presentation. So Brilliant. if we don't have any more questions, then we might be able to finish up slightly early. And just to let people know that um, the recording will be available um, in the next day or so. And um, I will send in via email a PDF copy of the slide presentation and the um, brochures from both services. So you will receive an email from me in the next day um, 
with that information. So thank you everybody for joining us and a big thank you to our presenters, Natalie Darcy from New South Wales Trustee and Guardian and Rebe Rebecca McHale from the Australian Death Notification Service. That is a big name, isn't it? It is. <laughs> thank, okay. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much for having us. Having us. It's, it's been a pleasure Thanks. and um, yeah, privilege to be able to share the information far and wide and hopefully get some people having some, some conversations about death. I think it's something that we tend to avoid um, speaking about in general, but it's, it's so beneficial to start those conversations early and to, you know, to know what people's wishes are and get those important documents in place as well. Yeah, I think that's right. I think I've got some work to do as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we'll say it's now afternoon. So we'll say good afternoon to everybody and thanks for joining this webinar. Bye thanks, everybody. Everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye.